Now, come up here, sister. Let her rip, sister. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, be not, be, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. That's in Luke chapter 2, 8 through 11, in the NIV translation. So, with that said, the reason that we're lighting the pink candle today is for rejoicing. Rejoicing in the preparation of the Lord's appearance. The pink candle also represents, and I don't know if many of y'all realize this or not, Advent and Lent go hand in hand. Yes. During Easter. And the pink candle in Lent is to symbolize a similar expectation of the coming of the Lord at Christ's coming and resurrection at Easter. So, in the prayer of St. Francis, I don't know if many of y'all know that or not, there's one line that says, where there is sadness, joy. So my question to you today is this, because y'all know that I found peace, have peace all week, praise the Lord. <laughs> Joy is a feeling. Joy is something that can't be contained. That's right. It, it glows. Come on, sister. It, it, it's there. Even in the rough times, there's a twinkle. Because when you're in the presence of the Lord, there's joy. Yes. And if you don't really understand that, I can give you an excellent example of that. We have a hobo that lives in our house. He showed up seven years ago with a bandana, a stick, and a harmonica. He also lives in a fur dog suit. And he adopted us. Doug is a pet whisperer because anytime he's outside, Hobo's right beside him. In the house is a small predator that has much joy when Doug comes home. <laughs> Hobo is content. He will let you. He will sit there all day, comfortable, at peace, at rest, right beside Doug. He would let him pet him all day until there was no fur left. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like he's resting in Doug's presence. So in my mind, that's how we should be when we're in the presence of the Lord. We're resting at the feet of Jesus. Because Hobo doesn't have a care in the world when he's sitting beside Doug. There's nothing that can come up that would make him even want to move. And there's a joy that radiates from Hobo. And it's the joy of being in the presence of his master. Yes. And I feel like as Christians, we miss that opportunity of being in the presence of our master because we can't put the cares of the world aside. Because even though we're in the world, Christians aren't supposed to be of the world. And so I hope that when you're out and about shopping, me and Doug saw it last night, there's some mad people. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they are mad. And ever since I got peace, Doug's been happy. So I was like, dude, something you're ready to happen to you because you're like over joyful tonight. <laughs> and is your joy in anticipation in the coming of the Christ child, is it radiating to non-believers? Because see, even non-believers celebrate Christmas. They say that they don't, but they do. Because they're, right. they're buying those ugly Christmas sweaters that I am against. 
I do not like them. I feel like, why are you making fun of Jesus? He's like, oh. But that's the way the world has turned it around to take the meaning off of what Christmas really is. So with that said, I'm going to ask our candle lighter. Today will be the last day that he is 15. All right. Because tomorrow at 1616, he arrived in this world. And <laughs> Look how tall he is. And he has brought us much joy yes. in our life. And I know that God is working in his life. I know that God is touching him. And his joy radiates from outside awesome. of him. So awesome. You may, and happy couple of days after your birthday, you too, Pastor David. <laughs> Constantly, that I got one more year before 60, and I said, Hey, that beats, <laughs> uh, that beats not making it to 60. Amen. So there you go. You got your Bible. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is a wonderful day to be in the Lord. Amen. It's a wonderful day. It's, it's a wonderful Christmas. You know, uh, uh, I know that all of us have had all of us have had some type of loss in our life. We're all suffering because of Bethany. Uh, we have a collective suffering or grief because of Bethany. And the closer you are to her, the closer the grief will be. And and of course, uh, uh, my head has leaked every day since she died. But that means it's not going to swell. Amen. That's right. And and I know that God's got her, but. God gives us a way to get through these things. First, let me just tell you this little story. There was a uh, first off, that there was a night at the children's Christmas play, and uh, it was a night at children's Christmas play. And little Johnny, y'all remember little Johnny? Little Johnny was upset because he didn't get the part of Joseph. He was assigned the innkeeper because he was still bitter. And Joseph and Mary arrived at the end to ask if there was room. Little Johnny threw the play by saying, "Sure, come on in." And Joseph was first taken back with a quick wit. He stepped up and looked around and said, This place is a dump. I'd rather stay in the barn. <laughs> and then there's my favorite I was going to use next week, but I'll use it this week just in case uh, we get so overjoyed next week. And then my favorite of all is the three boys at the Christmas play. They come up to hand their gifts to him, and, and the first one said, This is gold. The other one come and said, this is murder. The other boy come up and said, Frank sent me this. <laughs> My favorite of all time. That you didn't forget. <laughs> Second Samuel, stand for the reading of the word. Second Samuel, chapter 12. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 15. And Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. I want you to listen to that one more time, and just, I'm coming back to it, but I want you to, I want you to hear these words. And Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with him. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken to our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that the servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he had required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said the servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? 
Thou didn't fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didn't rise and eat bread. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I, I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he's dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return unto me. Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace, your mercy. I know, God, you're alive and well on the throne, Father. I know, God, that, that there's so many people, especially at this time of year, we're reminded of childhood memories and we're reminded of even close memories from, from just yesterday, it seems, that, and, and the people and the places are no longer there, and, and it brings hurt to us and brings us that great sense of loss. And, Lord, I ask you right now, Lord, to touch and anoint, Father, and help us to see beyond the normal. Help us to see beyond what we're feeling. And help us, God, to, to, to see spiritually and understand that there is, every man has an appointed time. And let us know that every event, there's a time and a season for everything. And Lord, Father, just like there's a time for mourning, there's also a time for dancing. I ask you, Lord, for that time of healing to take place. And Lord, let it start. If it hadn't already, let it start today. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we love you and we praise your name. And the church said... Amen. Amen. Get some high five, low five, no five, and tell me you're glad to be in God's house. Amen, amen, amen. God is so good to us. All right. We started this last week, and then just a little part, so I'm going to just briefly go over just a little bit from last week just to give us some continuity. And for those that weren't here, I don't want them to lag behind on the points. So, so here it is. Just bear with me. Uh, all of us, have, how many of us have had a loss in this last year? Everybody can raise their hand. We've all had losses. We've had personal losses. We've had family losses. We've had collective losses. Uh, just before Bethany died, I, I, preached, I preached three funerals for cancer patients who had died before Bethany. And then, uh, then uh, three weeks before she died, I preached for a mother who had died of cancer. And then uh, uh, Sister Kathleen, and then Sister Mary, and then Bethany, and then, and then uh, our brother Mike. Uh, Friday, so it's just, it's just, you know, I look, sit back and look, and, and, and one thing I've learned in life is, is that two things. Number one, life hurts. It hurts. You can't deny it. We can try to cover it up. We can try to sugarcoat it, but life hurts. It hurts when things are going good. It hurts when things are going bad. How many had things going good and it still got hurt? Amen. And you had things going bad and you got hurt. Life hurts. There's something else I understood, too, is that life goes on. Amen? And, and, and uh, uh, I remember when my mother died, uh, my wife Beverly could, would not shake it. She was just in such a, 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 a fog, and she was just in such a, a deep depression. And I remember talking to her, and I said, what is it? She said, well, that should have, could have, would have. If I'd have done this, if I'd have done that, and blah, blah, blah. And I looked over at Beverly, and I said, Beverly, Mama would not want you to crawl up in that coffin with her. And she thought about it for a minute. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, you have crawled in the coffin with her. I said, you're letting your life suffer. You're letting your life die because mama died and mama would not have that. Mama wants you to go and live and enjoy yourself and do something productive uh, for God's kingdom. And she said, you know, I didn't think about it that way. And from that day forward, she started healing and God did a mighty work in her life. And I'm here to tell you today, some of us may have crawled in the coffin with our loved one, and you can't do that because they would not want that. Amen? So now, so here it is. Watch this. Uh, uh, when, you're, when your broken heart overshadows your joyful heart, we just read, this, read the, the scripture about David and his baby. Now, Christmas is a season of joy, but it's, but it's not for some. No matter how hard they try, you know, I was walking around yesterday in Walmart, and I was in the days, and somebody said, are you Christmas shopping? I said, I really don't know what I'm doing. I said, I picked up some groceries, and I happened to see some Christmas stuff. And I told them, I said, you know, really, to be honest with you, if you want to say, if you're in the spirit, so to speak, the Christmas spirit, I said, well, I really don't have the Christmas spirit this year because, you know, I, I started looking the other day, and the first thing I thought of when I saw something, I said, I wonder if Beth, uh, Bethany would like that. Then I remembered, Bethany's not here. And I told y'all, then I thought about a thing, got a little chuckle. I said, well, where she's at, she wouldn't want anything from Walmart. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Walmart's got nothing of what she's experiencing. So, so, so look, so, so again, uh, uh, you may have been hurt, circumstances, losses, they've overshadowed you, they've crowded out your joy. 
When we look at the manger, which is life, all we can see is a coffin, which is death. Now, now again, that, that's, that's normal because the more connection we have with somebody, the more connection we have with something, when that thing is removed from our life, it leaves a vacuum. It leaves a hole. And I can tell you about this now. With God, there's a God-shaped vacuum within us, a God-shaped hole that only God can fill. And each loved one that you, have, that you lose along the way, there's going to be a hole in your heart. And let me just tell you something. Nobody can ever fill that hole. Nobody. Okay? But if you trust God, he can mend the broken heart. And he can apply salve. And he can apply the bomb of Gilead. God can do something in your life. And he can bring, bring joy in the middle of the pain. And he cannot listen. He won't fill their spot, but he'll pull somebody there. Or put something there to help you get through the adjustments that you have to make in your life. So now, so now, here we go. This is from last week again. Have you ever felt like that? See a little fellow there? A little stuffed animal that's hard all out, got pins all in it? You know, again, this is real quick, trying to get over the, get through this. That they're, in everybody's life, when you start experiencing loss, this is what happens. You have the hit, you have the hurt, and you have the healing. Now, now what it is, is how much you are invested in the hit determines how hard the process will be for the healing. It depends on how bad it's going to hurt. You know, I read about those 40 people in Japan in that restaurant. They were all killed last, or not killed, but injured. You know what? That, that grieves me, but that doesn't grieve me like if it happened in Greenville. It doesn't grieve me like it would have been in Washington, and it definitely doesn't grieve me the way it would have if my family had been in there. So again, your connection, your, invest, your investment in the hit determines how hard the healing it, the process is going to be. So, so David here, David's in this process. He's lost a child. Uh, and so, so what did he do after his loss? He did, he did three things. And here we go. We're, here we come from last week. The last one from last week. And we're hitting the hard. Ready? <coughs> How many is ready to say amen? Amen. Y'all almost said it together. Everybody ready to say amen? Amen. All right. <laughs> All right. The very first thing. This is where we stopped last week. He accepted what he could not change. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord be gracious to me that that child may live? But now, he, now he's dead. Should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I can go to him, but he cannot return to me. The problem is, too many of us get stuck in the past. We get stuck in that pool of the past. Uh, we're always reliving what's going on in our mind. We relive that, that pain. We relive that, we relive that hurt. And, and, and a lot of times we, because we have something called survivor's guilt, because we say, well, it should have been me and not them, or, or God, why'd you take them and not me, and all these things go in our mind, we have survivor's guilt. And when we get survivor's guilt, honestly, whenever you start to heal, you, you will shut off the process. When somebody's got survivor's guilt, listen to me one more time. When somebody's got survivor's guilt, they're saying, it should have been me. I don't know why this happened. And I wish I could change it. And, 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 and should have, could have, would have. And I get survivor's guilt. Every time, when you got survivor's guilt, every time God begins to start the healing process in you, you shut the healing process down. So you have to stop. That's Listen, number one, survivor's guilt. I remember after... Beverly died. And I remember she died at Christmas time. And I remember how bad it felt. Uh, we, buried her on, uh, we buried her on the day before Christmas Eve, 23rd. And I remember how Christmas felt. And I felt so bad that there was presents in there that, that she and I had bought together for the boys. And now I'm giving to the boys. I'm giving them to Bethany. And then I remember Daniel was just graduating from high school. And I'm thinking, she should be here for that. And she's not. Why am I here? And she's not. And so for the first six months, I had so much survivor's guilt. And the Lord showed me. Here's what he showed me. As long as you allow yourself to be consumed in survivor's guilt, every time I try to heal you, you're going to stop it. You're going to shut it down. So take your hand off the trigger, get your hand off of the stop sign, and let me do my work. I know what I'm doing. And I began to heal. So, so again, it, it robs your peace, it robs your power. But it's amazing what freedom takes place when you learn to accept what you cannot change. Ready? That's number one. Number two, I love this, adjust your focus. He focused on what was left. Listen carefully, please listen to this. 
He focused on what was left, not what was lost. Wow. One more time. He focused on what was left, not on what was lost. The Bible says, And David come to Bathsheba, his wife, and went to her and lay with her, and she bare him a son, and she called him Solomon. All right? That, 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 watch this. That, I, didn't, I didn't go that far, but I got stopped on purpose. I wanted to kind of pull this one out at the last minute. You see, it's okay to, to, to look back to yesterday, but it's not okay to dwell on it. You cannot dwell on this. And I want you to notice something. In verse 15, <laughs> listen to this. This is, this is something. This is amazing. In verse 15, it says that Uriah, the child that Uriah's wife had is sick. She's called Uriah's wife. But after the child died and he was comforting her, he said, listen, he said, Bathsheba, my wife. Look at the change. What had happened, the reason the child was here, the reason all the stuff behind it, all this guilt, all this shame, everything behind David because it was Uriah's wife. But listen, once he began to accept the comfort that God had for him, get beyond the survivor's guilt and let God work in his life, now it went from Uriah's wife, now it's to Bathsheba, my wife. Wow, he put the past behind him. Some of us in here, we would, life would change 180 degrees today if you could learn to put the past behind you. If you can put it behind you and accept the grace and the mercy that God has given. So now, so now watch this now. Watch, I love this. Again, here we go. This is, this is, stay right here on this one now. Folks, the law was left, not the law was lost. When you have a misdirected focus, it brings nothing but pain. And these questions, why, why, why? Wow. Why did I do that? Why was I so stupid? Why didn't I see that coming? Why didn't I understand this? Why didn't I see this? Why didn't I know this? Why didn't I try this? Why, why, why? And it pulls you. And every time you try to move forward, it keeps you pulling you backwards. You cannot move forward because all you can think of is why, why, why? That survivor's guilt, that other guilt's coming in and it's pulling you and pulls you back. When you redirect your focus, not on what was, what, was, what was lost, but what was left, now you've got some healing beginning because now you begin to answer, why not? Why can't I get up from this thing? Why, why can't I accept that God called them home? Why can't I accept that this was their time? Why not? Why can't I accept that everybody has a time in the season and this was their season? Why can't I accept that God has called me to stay behind and move forward? I, why, why can't I get up and move from this thing? The pain is real, and it's going to be real for a long time. But now I've got to push. I'm not being pulled. If I looked at all that was lost, I get pulled. But if I look at what was left, I get a push. And so you got to look at what was left. Again, like I said, it's okay to look back to yesterday, but don't dwell on it or don't get stuck in it. He said, watch this, the baby was gone. I cannot... He can't come to me, but I can go to him. And Bathsheba was still there. The baby was gone, but Bathsheba was there. And it's reality check time. Again, right now, I'm challenging everyone in here. If you're suffering from any kind of loss, grief and loss in your life right now, don't focus on what you lost. Focus on what was left. Because when you begin to do this, it's amazing the freedom that will begin to take place in your life. Amen? So, so watch this. Number three. He turned to God. It said, Then David rose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And then he came to his own house and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Watch this. Some of y'all need to do this <laughs> today. I dare you to do this today. You don't have to raise your hand, but if you're here right now, and I say, how many, don't raise your hand. If I say, how many in here is suffering from great pain from loss? You do this. The pain's going to still be there. Remember, to, to get over doesn't mean you never remember. To get over doesn't mean it won't be pain. What it means is you remember with less pain. That's it. You remember with less pain. Matter of fact, you know, I, I, the last couple of days, all I've been thinking about, I've been thinking so much about Bethany's death, I've been thinking about Bethany's life. 
And I think about some of the crazy things she did. You know, like, like it's so funny, I'd say, she rode up here in the short bus, and she'd go, well, Dad, you drove it. And, and, and uh, the other day there was something going on and I got running my mouth and I was so used to Bethany being in the corner going. And so I told somebody, I said, you know what, it'd be cool if Bethany was here because you know what she'd be doing? She'd be looking at me going, Dad. And her favorite saying what it was was, what it happened was, and so we go around the house all the time going, what it happened was, instead of look, focusing on her death, started focusing on her life. And that helps you move forward. So watch this. First thing he did. Watch this. It's so awesome. He got up. He got up. When Joshua, when, if you look at the first book of Joshua, the Bible says for Joshua to arise. Why was he telling Joshua to arise? He was telling Joshua to arise because Joshua was mourning Moses' death. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Now arise. Get up from your mourning and move forward. There's land to be conquered. There's things to be done. Don't lay here and wither away. Get up and move forward. So, same with us. you got to get up. Number two, he cleansed himself, physically and spiritually. I'm telling you, I, I can imagine this whole situation with him and Bathsheba had already been bad on him. He thought about it. It's already been eating him alive, and he got everything right with God. He worked out. You know, when we get going through things, uh, uh, one thought is for Bethany, and, and and before that, my wife, and before that, my mother. All of them at Christmas time, I, I, I sit back and I think about the times I had to stop my stinking thinking and say, God, you got to get my mind back in order. You got to get me back looking in the right direction. You know. So so here we go. He cleansed himself. And he put on clean clothes. He changed his attitude. Now, please don't point. But how many here know somebody with a bad attitude? Don't point. <laughs> I saw somebody sit on your hands. <laughs> you have to change your attitude. Yes, there's loss behind us. But I can promise you there's going to be more loss before it's all over with. In years to come, there's going to be more loss. And, and how you handle this loss is going to determine how well you handle the next loss. And so you learn these techniques and you move forward. As you move forward, the next time you have a loss, it's still going to hurt. But at least you can move along in a better way. All right? And then, you went to church. You went to hear from God again. And finally, he worshipped his God again. And he learned to trust him all over again. Now, I'm getting ready to close because we got, we got a parade to get ready for. But I don't want to get in the parade and try to rejoice in the parade if we can't get the parade moving forward because we're all moving backwards. Amen? Amen. My mom said I wore my first pair of shoes walking backwards. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Comforted. The Bible said that he comforted his wife. He, wrote, look, he went to Bathsheba and comforted her. Look, that word comfort means to console, to breathe strongly. It means to, 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 to give life again. Amen? So, so watch this. In this episode right here, David has gone from the griever to the grief reliever. He's gone from being, being full of grief to now being full of love and compassion to be able to do something for his wife. David was a type of Christ, the anointed one. The Holy Ghost comfort. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost comfort. And watch this. St. Corinthians 1 and 4 says, He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they're troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. I, I, was, in the, I was in Walmart yesterday. I was trying to hurry, get out. And, and this one guy walked up to me and I honestly did not know this guy. I don't know where he came from. He looked at me and he said, you know where the air conditioning filters are? And I said, yeah, they're about, you're looking in the wrong section. I was in the household section. I said, you down about three, block, three, three blocks, three, three rows. And he said, uh, and he said, he said, you know, I know it has to be hard. And the first thing, because I didn't know the guy, I was thinking, Tim, it's hard to find air conditioning filters. <laughs> no, it's not that hard. Go down to aisle 13, you'll see him right around that corner. And he said, he said, I lost my daddy about, about this time. 
two years ago. And I went, oh, here's one of those God moments. And so he began, and I'm not going to go into the story, but the, the, the story, the, in the whole story, he talked about how God had given him strength and courage and, and, and all this stuff. It was an amazing story. But the greatest thing I took away from that, all that beautiful story that he was telling me, in the middle of loss, it was beautiful. In the middle of his dad's death, it was still beautiful, the stuff that he was talking about. Like with Bethany, there was some beautiful stuff happening in her death. And then he said, my daddy loved uh, yellow. And he said, my daddy loved butterflies. He loved yellow. And he said, a few weeks after my daddy passed, he said, I was on a fishing boat. I was 40 miles offshore. And he said, I was thinking about my daddy. And he said, I was, it just it hurt. And he said, I, I just want to know that daddy was comforting now because daddy had, his daddy had had cancer too. And, and, and he said, and while I went to the back of my boat 40 miles, I, I, reckon, I reckon he was the captain. But he said, his mate came up to him. And he said, 40 miles offshore, he said, our boat was bombarded with yellow butterflies. He said, they came from, he said, I have no idea where they come from. He said, we're 40 miles offshore. And he said, hundreds of yellow butterflies bombarded the boat. And he said, I knew my daddy was safe. Wow. Isn't it amazing how God brings comfort? Amen. So not only did he comfort her, but it says he went into her with her again and what it was that she conceived. Now watch this. It's important in this story that we hear about her conceiving again. He said, well, that's their business. I don't know why they even got it and put it in there because, because it began with a bad situation. The first baby, bad situation. And so now God wants to show. Remember, I told you, when you first talk about the woman that's Uriah's wife, then at the end of the story, it's David's wife. See, God's already doing something. God's showing mercy and grace. God's doing some change. And now David has moved needed comfort. Now has become the comforter because now he's understanding all this. And now watch this. She has another baby. Maybe she has now Solomon. Solomon was the greatest king in Israel. Wow. What you think about Solomon? You see, Solomon actually means... And I can you know, go to a, 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 a shilamol, which means that, which is where we get the word peaceful or shalom, and uh, it means peace, safety, well, to be happy. It means to means to prosper in every sense of the word, physically, mentally, emotionally. It means to have peace and prosperity in every sense of the mode, and every sense of that name. Now watch this now. Look, look. In the beginning of this chapter. He has no peace. He has no safety. He has, he's not feeling anything other than hurt and regret. And now, God takes in the middle of the worst pain you can possibly go through, he takes it and he turns it around and brings Solomon. Wow. I'm here to tell you something. It'll rain again. You may not feel it right now. It's going to rain again. And like I told people over there, I said, oh, look, look, when I think about Bethany, yeah, we, we, we proverbially buried her body. Actually, she's in a urn. But still, we buried her body, but we planted her seeds. There's a difference. And her seeds are growing. I see it growing all the time. I see things happening all the time that Bethany did. And Bethany tried to push forward with the mayors and push forward with Team Bethany. And, 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 and it's just amazing to me the stuff that's happening. And, and the people come to me and say, you know what? After I saw what she went through, if she could go through that, I can go through this. Or I, I want you to know your daughter really inspired my faith. I want you to really know how she actually made a change in my life because I watched how she handled this with so much grace. And, and, and so, again, <laughs> I'm watching. Listen, listen, God has put God. God knows. God sees. God understands. And see, watch this. Remember, there's the hurt. The hit, the hurt, the healing. Not only the hit, the hurt, and the healing, but if you let God breathe on you, now there's going to be hope. And as there's hope, there comes healing. And with the healing, there comes happiness. I found myself in the last few days chuckling more than I've chuckled in such a long time. I found myself in the last few days finding some joy that I didn't even think 
was even there anymore because I began to focus on her life, not her death. I didn't begin to stop focusing on her burial and started focusing on what she planted. And as I did, I find myself getting, getting, getting better and better and better on the inside because I'm focusing on that. Watch this. Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. Now I want you to see something here. Just those two, that's that one verse right there. Two things. Unto, unto us a child is born. It's talking about the incarnation of Christ. Unto us a son is given. That's talking about the cross. So God come in the form of man, he's born, a son is given, he's given on the cross, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting God, the Prince of Peace. Wow. Let God put together that broken heart and mend it, mend it, mend it. Well, you know what, once God puts his hands on your, hand, on your heart, it's amazing what happens. Give it to him and watch what he'll do. God is so awesome. BJ, come on up here, bro. We've all got things we can look back on and wish we could change. And to the things you can change, change them. But ask God for wisdom and surrender to prayer. Give me sense enough to know, wisdom to know the things I can change and things I can't change. The things I can change give me wisdom to do it. The things I can change give me the wisdom to leave it alone. And there's a lot of things that we have lost over the years. You're not going to get back. You've got to get it in heaven. And so when you can dwell on that thought, like David said, he's not coming back to me. I can go to him. God is so awesome. Everybody stand. All right, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Don't look around. Because I'm going to ask some hard questions right now, and I don't want anybody to see your answers. When nobody's looking around, your eyes are closed, heads bowed. If you're having problems, Today, because of a loss from yesterday back. And it's clouding your mind, it's clouding your heart, and it's causing you not to be able to really enjoy or move forward like you know God would have you. But you just put up that hand quickly. Just put them up. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Maybe you're here and you're just suffering loss and you're just trying to move forward. You're, you're still moving, but you just feel like you can do better if you could just learn what David learned. If I'm talking to you and nobody looking around, just slip your hand up quickly. Yes, I just need to learn how to do that. I need to just uh, put it behind me. I challenge you today to not focus on what was lost but focus on what was left, what is left, not what was lost, what is left. Also challenge you to quit dwelling on the negative of what you lost and start dwelling on the positive of what was left. Yes, it hurts. It hurts. Badly. Like I said, I can't think of a day goes by that I think about that girl, I tear up, my heart hurts, but I know that she is not hurting, and that brings me comfort. <laughs> if you're here right now, and you're just needing help to do what David did, giving it to God, I can't see Bathsheba, my wife. I can't 
can't see what God is doing fresh in my life. All I can see is the pain in the past. And God wants so much to do something special. Right now, everybody, y'all pray this loud with me. Father, help me put the past in the past and keep it there. Amen. Amen. Brother Wayne, will you dismiss us in prayer, please?